Battlecruisers are a fascinating type of warship from the early half of the 20th century, namely because they are an amalgamation of multiple types of warship thrown into one gigantic vessel for a specific role. However, each independent navy that would come to operate battlecruisers could not agree on what this role was, and this resulted in each navy constructing battlecruisers in their own separate manner. That statement leads us up to the purpose of this video, which is addressing a huge misconception regarding battlecruisers, and that is the definition given for them in modern terms, which is a ship that sacrifices armor and armaments in order to obtain higher speeds. In order to address why this definition is incorrect, we need to analyze each individual navy's approach to the battlecruiser, and thus we are going to start with the first navy to commission a battlecruiser, and this is Imperial Japan. During the Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905, many of Japan's naval successes relied heavily on large caliber guns rather than the medium caliber guns that were being incorporated into battleships and were the main armament of armored cruisers at that time period. The Japanese Navy grew a distaste for the medium caliber gun when you're building ship hauls that are the size of battleships, and thus, for their new class of armored cruisers, they decided to upgun the ship significantly to match that of a standard battleship. On the 14th of January, 1905, at the Kirei Naval Yard, the keel to the first ship of this concept was laid, and it would eventually be named Tsukuba. Later on, it would be followed up by its near-identical sister ship, Ikoma, which was laid down on the 15th of March 1905 at the same location. As far as the design of the hull goes, it almost mirrors an armored cruiser. The main belt has a maximum thickness of 7 inches, while the armored deck has a maximum thickness of 2 inches, but where this ship is significant is the main battery guns, which consisted of four 12-inch 45 caliber weapons. Having a gun caliber of 12 inches on a cruiser hull was unheard of at the time, and the Japanese would continue to develop on this philosophy, and they would end up creating a follow-up class, the Kurama class, which consisted of Kurama, which was laid down on the 23rd of August 1905 at the Yokosuka Naval Yard, and the Yibuki, which was laid down on the 23rd of May 1907 at Kure, when funding and a slipway was available. Overall, the statistics between these two classes is comparable, but there is a category that was heavily altered, and this was speed, which was done through adjusting the hydrodynamics and propulsion system between the two classes. The Tsukuba class had a maximum length of 450 feet, and they had two sets of three-cylinder reciprocating engines driving two propellers for a maximum speed of 20 and a half knots. When we go over to the Kurama class, the length of the hull was increased to 485 feet, and there were two different propulsion systems used between the two ships of this class. Kurama had two triple expansion engines driving two screws, while Ibuki had two Curtis turbines driving two screws, and both ships were capable of 23 knots. When Japan went to register these four ships, they ran into a slight issue. They did not consider these vessels armored cruisers as they were more powerful, but they were not as powerful as a battleship. And so, for the time period, they created a class that they simply called Heavy Armored Cruisers, which was effectively an intermediate design between the armored cruiser and the battleship. While Japan was developing and constructing its four heavy armored cruisers, there was a man across the globe who was also working on similar concepts, and his name was John Fisher, an admiral in the Royal Navy. In the years of 1902 and 1903, Admiral Fisher began developing a theory that battleships should take a path where construction focused more on completing them with a great number of large caliber guns rather than trying to mingle a small number of large caliber guns with a small number of medium caliber guns. Of course, this theory would see the day of light in 1906 when the hull to HMS Dreadnought was launched and commissioned later that year with 10 12-inch main battery guns and no medium caliber guns to support them. Though Britain was not the only nation at the time developing a battleship along these lines, they were the first to successfully construct and commission one. But Admiral Fisher still had an issue with Dreadnought. Though it possessed a large number of main battery guns, it did not possess the tactical speed advantage he had also been theorizing on since the results of the Russo-Japanese War. Given some time to develop a new vessel, he would eventually create what becomes the Invincible, which worked on the same philosophies we had already seen the Japanese implement four times over again. Now when we look at the statistics of the armor, it is comparable to what the Japanese had already installed on their heavy armored cruisers. 
The main armor belt had a maximum thickness of 6 inches, while the main armor deck had a maximum thickness of 2 inches. Where this ship is different is the hull size was dramatically increased so that a larger propulsion system could be installed for greater speed, and there was a larger number of main battery guns since now there was more available space to install them. Just as Invincible was being completed, Britain laid down the keels to three more ships of the Indefatigable class, which was largely identical to the Invincible with slight alterations, such as the deck armor was increased to 2.5 inches in certain locations. These ships are often considered rushed designs, which is why they were not too indifferent from Invincible, and this is because of a public outcry from word that Germany was now working on its own variation of the battlecruiser. In the 1904 Naval Magazine edition, a man named Kaiser Wilhelm II would write an article which was criticizing the concept of the armored cruiser as it stood in 1904. He said that the vessels were catching up to the battleship in cost, material usage, and size for very little payoff. Though armored cruisers he considered to be necessary accessories for supporting battleships, he did not understand the purpose of constructing this class of warship if it was catching up to the battleship in those three factors, and thus he essentially said, why not just build battleships and ignore armored cruisers altogether? Kaiser Wilhelm II was an advocate for a vessel the size of a battleship, with the armor and armaments of a battleship, but faster than a battleship. Once Invincible entered the field, Germany now had a reason to prioritize the Kaiser's concept, and eventually this would result in the development of the von der Tann. Germany's take on what they classed as the Große Cruiser, or Large Cruiser, was very different from what the Japanese and British had already pursued. The main belt on von der Tann reached 10 inches thick, while the armored deck would almost reach 3 inches in certain locations. Von der Tann was paired up with the battleship Nassau in the construction program. Nassau's main belt was just under 11 inches, which means there's not even an inch difference in the armor belt in this scenario, and Nassau's armor deck only reached 2 inches, which meant von der Tann actually had more deck armor in certain locations than Nassau. Now a significant difference between these two classes is the armaments. The main battery of Nassau consists of six turrets with each carrying two 11-inch guns. However, they are in the hexagonal layout, meaning only four could ever be bought on a broadside. Von der Tann uses four turrets, each carrying two 11-inch guns, but the arrangement is more efficient, which means that it has the same potential of a four-turret broadside. Now the reason for going more in depth on Nassau and von der Tann compared to the other two nations that I'd previously brushed is to emphasize the fact that Germany did not sacrifice armor and armaments between its battlecruisers and battleships in any instance. The battleships and battlecruisers that were paired together in the German Navy remain nearly identical in comparable values. Now the British did not remain ignorant to the German philosophy of battlecruiser construction, and thus British designs begin to reflect Britain's acknowledgement of what Germany was doing. Britain's battlecruisers begin to see an increase in armor to a 9 to 10 inch belt and a 2 to 3 inch deck, while the armament remains comparable to the battleships as they always had been from the start. That is a factor that I noticed is heavily overlooked when looking at British battlecruisers in specific. They never sacrificed armaments. Dreadnought had 10 12-inch guns in an arrangement where only four turrets could be brought on a broadside. Its companion battlecruiser, Invincible, had four turrets with 12-inch guns, but all four of these could be brought on a broadside, which means the output of power was the same between the two ships. When we get to later designs, like the Lion pairing up with Orion, we see an increase to the 13.5-inch gun on both of these ships, though Lion does have one less turret. Now I know the argument here would be that since Lion has one less turret, it has an entire turret's worth of mass savings, which on the surface is true. However, when you actually look at the mass values of these two ships, Lion was about five to 10,000 tons heavier than Orion, which meant that this turret mass saving is neglectable. Even if the British opted to install a fifth turret on Lion, it would still be several knots faster than its companion battleship, for a specific reason that is shared amongst all three of these nations' battlecruisers. Battlecruisers are an evolution of the armored cruiser. This means that the hull concept is based off cruiser philosophies and not battleship philosophies, while armaments are on battleship philosophies and not cruiser philosophies. 
Speed is an important factor for a cruiser, but it was not always a top priority, as is in the case with the German Navy, where their battle cruisers only had about a 3 knot advantage on their battleships. Britain's battle cruisers generally had a 6 knot advantage over their companion battleships, but this is where we run into another philosophy difference between individual nations operating the battle cruiser. And this is the fact that the way they intended to use the battle cruiser was separate from one another. Britain's battle cruiser philosophies were developed by using the battle cruisers as reconnaissance vessels and as hunters for vessels that were comparatively inferior to them. They were never intended to go up against comparable battle cruisers and, of course, heavier battleships. Japan and Germany began working on philosophies that were very similar to one another. They had the intention of using their battle cruisers in the main battle line with battleships. Reconnaissance was second-hand duty for these vessels, and if a battleship was knocked out of the battle line, a battle cruiser should be capable of filling in this gap and successfully completing the role that the battleship was intended for. Britain does not really take this path until you reach the Admiral class battle cruiser on its heavily altered design as a result of Jutland, and of course, this culminated in the Hood. Of course, Hood catches up to HMS Queen Elizabeth in comparable armor values and the exact same potential broadside armament of eight 15-inch guns. Japan, in the 1920s, works on the Tosa class and Amagi class, which there was only about a one-inch armor difference on the main belt and less than an inch difference on the decks, and the main armament for both was a potential broadside of 10 16.1-inch guns, which just goes to show that the battlecruiser concept over time was heavily altered by the navies using them. Germany's designs are the only ones that remain consistent on the intended use of the battle cruiser. So this leads us to the ultimate question, what exactly is a battle cruiser? The issue is, there is no definition as to what a battle cruiser is. Battle cruisers were always intended to be loosely defined vessels, as it left each individual nation open to interpretation as to how they wanted these vessels to be designed, and this is probably a big factor that led into the downfall of the battle cruiser and why they were only constructed for about 15 years. Some basic criteria points that remained consistent between the three navies that were constructing and commissioning battle cruisers was the hull design should remain consistent with cruisers of their time period, the armor values could take the end of two scales, they can either be a continuation of the armored cruiser era, which is the thinner end of armor values, or they can be comparable to that of a companion battleship, which is the thicker end of armor values. The armaments should be comparable to that of their companion battleships, and they should have a speed advantage of their companion battleships, either to assist within filling in gaps when a battleship is knocked out of line, or to perform successful reconnaissance duties and hunting operations. With that having been said, that is all I have to say on this topic for today. So, if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like and comment down below. Have a wonderful day.